one of my problems with this case, which was that each time he presented to me with symptoms, I continued to look for surgical solutions to his symptoms, and that may or may not have been appropriate. But about a month uh, after this uh, uh, T lift, uh, he presented to me with right hip pain, and so I obtained a CT scan which uh, demonstrated no problems with our bone graft and no problems with our screws, although you could make the case that he still had some foraminal stenosis at L4-5. Um, a month after that, he continued to uh, complain of worsening pain, this time on the right side, and I obtained an, an MRI scan. And, um, and so now he's two months after his most recent surgery, which was the T lift. And unfortunately, as you see on the left, he has um, uh, on a gadolinium enhanced MRI, he has some rim enhancement of the fluid uh, in his uh, decompression defect. And, um, uh, and, and it was, we were questioning whether this represented infection or not. He um, uh, did not have a fever. He did not have uh, uh, persistent wound drainage. Um, but it became apparent that this was indeed infection. He, he, uh, his symptoms got worse and we, um, we explored him and uh, found uh, gross purulence. His blood cultures began to grow out uh, methicillin sensitive staph aureus. And we began uh, our usual treatment for uh, a surgical site infection, which is uh, a series of irrigation and debridement surgeries and uh, parental antibiotics. After two of those IND surgeries, his serum inflammatory markers were not improving, and I obtained this MRI scan. Uh, based on, on the fact that he wasn't improving, I felt that I needed to remove his implants to give him as good a chance as possible to clear the infection. However, um, over the next two weeks, um, he was in and out of various levels of uh, mental orientation, and we could not get a good uh, uh, neurologic exams on him from day to day. Uh, and it was not clear whether that was due to his uh, somnolence or his, um, uh, uh, or whether he was he was developing dementia. Uh, and um, uh, and when he finally woke up. Um, it was clear that he was paraplegic. He could not move his legs. And that is what prompted us to obtain this CT scan. And as you can see on the far left image, he's got uh, uh, quite a bit of dislocation of L2 on L3. Um, and he has uh, quite a bit of absorption from the bodies of L2 and L3. You can see that in that mid-sagittal cut. And then, of course, in the axial cut, you see the dreaded uh, uh, double canal sign of, uh, of a, a dislocation. And so at this point, uh, there, was, there was no, in my mind, there, there was no role for small surgeries uh, anymore. And, uh, and so we took them promptly for a large uh, decompression and, uh, and resection and reconstruction. And, and so... Uh, what we did was uh, all from the back, we, we instrumented into um, uh, vertebral levels uh, at some distance from where we had been operating uh, and, and achieved fixation and, and then performed uh, essentially hemicorpectomies of uh, L2 and L3 and placed um, an expandable spacer in that uh, corpectomy defect. This was a, a post-operative CT scan. You can see that we've realigned him uh, and, um, and we've done a, a, a pretty decent job of, of making sure that his canal was decompressed. Um, but unfortunately, uh, over time, uh, this was two months uh, post-operative. He had uh, a seroma. His serum inflammatory markers after this final surgery did normalize. And I uh, include these images just to show that we finally had achieved uh, a very reasonable decompression of his spinal canal, but he has not uh, uh, returned any of his motors in his lower extremities. Uh, uh, at this point, nine months after the final surgery, he has um, 
uh, normalized his serum inflammatory markers uh, and, uh, uh, and looks to have a stable construct, uh, uh, but unfortunately remains paraplegic. And so, um, you know, when Sam asked me to uh, put together this uh, case presentation, I thought about, you know, what are the lessons that, that I could take away from this? Well, one is a lesson that I often tell our, uh, our residents and our medical students and our fellow, um, you know, keep a high level of suspicion and, and, and see your patients often postoperatively if they're not doing well. In this patient's case, uh, he had an infection even in the absence of fever, even in the absence of uh, a skin wound breakdown, um, but his symptoms did not make sense to me. Uh, I couldn't understand why, why he was complaining of the pain that he was complaining of, and, um, and, and that probably was my, my tip off, the signal maybe that I, I was slow to pick up on. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, um, uh, a lesson that I took away from this is, is to get frequent imaging. Uh, you know, during his hospital course, when he became obtunded uh, and we could no longer do daily uh, neurologic exams, I, I probably should have been more aggressive with, with obtaining advanced imaging um, uh, to make sure that I understood what was going on because clearly what happened was that his infection extended into an L23 discitis and began to um, uh, dissolve or eat away at the bodies of uh, L2 and L3 until he was just grossly um, unstable. Uh, and, and, um, and so I think in my, in my mind, when fixation is removed early for infection, this is a signal to me that I, I need to get more frequent and be more uh, aggressive with imaging, especially when I can't rely on exams of the patient. So that, that's, that's what I have to share with the uh, group today. Thank you, Ted. Uh, such an excellent presentation with an uh, unfortunate uh, sequence of events. And it raises a very important point that, that we always uh, fall in, which is when you have an infection, whether you remove the implants or not, when your infection is not responding to several uh, INDs. But uh, let me ask you this. I've noticed that he had a fracture at the level of L23 when you had your TLF at the level of L34. Uh, why do you think he broke one level above, not at the level of the TLF? Yeah, so I, I think that um, uh, for, for reasons that were unclear to me uh, and, and that I didn't pick up on early, his infection must have extended into the L23 disc to become a discitis. Um, and uh, 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 as you know, Sam, typically we'll try to treat these, uh, these early surgical site infections by leaving the implants in place. Um, and, and I've come to rely on uh, the, the CRP level. I think it's, it's probably been the most uh, responsive serum marker to me about whether we are adequately debriding the infection. Uh, because in cases where we have adequately debrided it, the CRP starts to normalize. And in this guy's case, it did not do that until we, we uh, committed to the, the massive uh, resection and reconstruction. Right. And uh, I have here a comment from uh, uh, one of the attendees, Professor Khattab, is, uh, was the patient diabetic? Do you believe it's a charcoal spine? He was not diabetic. And, and, um, and so, uh, no, I don't think this was a uh, charcoal spine, not, at least not in the, um, in the traditional sense that we understand the denervated joint. Um, he was obtunded from his systemic infection. Uh, and, um, and that's the best I can say about that. Right. I have another question for you, actually. There is sometimes when you have uh, done a uh, one level fusion case or something and you do an x ray like six weeks post op and you find that hell on the x hell on the x ray around the screws, usually I, it's, it's very challenging. You don't know what to interpret out of that. If you show it to a radiologist, he'll probably tell you that there is loosening of the screws. But then you know very well that this patient doesn't have infection. It's probably very early post-operative. So what's your interpretation of that hell around the screw that we see really early after uh, instrumentation surgeries? Yeah, so sometimes as early as the, the day after surgery, right? right. So, um, uh, so in those cases, um, I've, I've learned to just make a mental note of it, uh, of what looks like uh, lucency around a screw. 
But if the patient clinically is, is responding like they should and acting like they have a stable segment, um, I, I just make note of it and, and watch it serially until I start to see signs that the bone is reacting around that, then I, then I become more uh, worried. Right. Dr. Yostri, uh, uh, any comments? Yes, uh, Ted, usually the elderly don't show signs and symptoms for uh, infection. That's why, we sh as you said, we should uh, be alert and uh, diagnose it before they do. Yeah, you, you, um, you know, what's funny is uh, th this is a lesson that I, I, from time to time, I have to learn and then relearn. I've had other elderly patients who uh, healed their skin incision, uh, looked on the surface like they, they were okay, and yet we're, we're uh, harboring a deep infection. Yep, you're right. And then, um, uh, okay, Jens Chapman, do you have any comments? Thank you for sharing that case, Ted. Uh, these are humbling things, these are cult infections. I have a question to you, and this is, I don't know the answer. Um, intraoperative vancomycin, yes, no, when, how, and can this delay the presentation of a deep surgical site infection? Well, I can, I can tell you in this patient's case, he did have uh, intraoperative, uh, you know, at, at the time of closing, powdered vancomycin. Um, as you know, Jens, uh, there, there have been a lot of smallish clinical series. Um, and, and I would say in my reading of the literature, probably two thirds of those series to three quarters would suggest that, that it is effective at, um, at preventing some surgical site infections, but, but then the, uh, the minority of, of studies would suggest that it is not effective. We have typically, uh, over the last few years, used vancomycin in our implant cases or in our morbidly obese patients, thinking that those are the higher risk patients, uh, but we have no evidence that guides me on how much we should use. Uh, should we use it both deep and superficial to the lumbar fascia? Uh, we just have no evidence to guide us. And now, Ahmad Nasr, uh, you uh, published an excellent paper a couple of years ago regarding the uh, irrigation with betadine uh, for surgical wounds before closure. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think uh, one subtle cause of infection that may be under uh, uh, realizes that the hair follicles themselves can't be prepped uh, with a traditional skin prep before surgery. So I am a big believer in trying to use something to try to eradicate some of the bacteria that live in the base of the hair follicle. So I, I usually will fill the entire wound with a dilute betadine before bone grafting. But after instrumentation, it's just a habit that I've come into. I try to cover the skin edges with betadine soaked laps and I wait for four minutes. It's based off of not my paper, but a different paper that I had uh, read previously, but it's now become part of my practice. And uh, I also use vancomycin powder. I know it's controversial, but I, I uh, think the combination of the two things have kept my gener generally my wound infection rate fairly low, and, um, and I've been happy with that. Have you had any experience of post-operative seroma as a result of using vancomycin powder, any of the panel? Well, I've, cer I've certainly had post-operative seromas, uh, and, and because we had been routinely using vancomycin in uh, our implant cases, I, I don't know whether vancomycin was the cause or not. Right. Then there is a comment from uh, uh, Naif uh, from Saudi. Uh, well, welcome, Naif. Uh, vancomycin uh, decreases the surgical site infection, but increases the rate of gram-negative uh, infection rate uh, that's from a meta-analysis of a recent paper. And uh, then there is another question, uh, do you use vancomycin subfacial or after facial closure? Yeah, so personally, um, uh, the, I use it both. I use it, uh, I take a gram and I, I sprinkle half of the gram um, around the implants and then close the fascia and then the other half gram in the uh, sub-Q fat. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, uh, for sharing your case. And uh, can you um, share your screen, um, Jens, with your case? Gladly. I 
I'm waiting. Oops. Um, we you have to make him a co-host. He is a co-host. Dana. Sam, yes. can you hear me? Yes, we yeah, can hear while, we're, while we're waiting to echo what's been said um, in the audience, um, I myself as well, I do typically uh, use the Venko powder, but yes, the, the Japanese, the recent Japanese study showed that although it reduces the risk of SSI from 1.9% to 1.7%, which is non-significant, it increased the risk of gram-negative infection on the other hand. So it's still certainly a, um, a controversial thing to do, uh, although we, we use it as safety blanket most of the time. Thank you, Jay. We can see the screen, um, Jens. Trying to get in. Well, sorry guys. I had to jump through my various hoops in my system. And I think we're working good. Let me move this around. So, do you see my screen? You. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. You can hear me. Samech and Omar and uh, dear colleagues, thank you for inviting me. Uh, congratulations on putting this together. This is a difficult and important subject. And uh, like Ted, I have complications and um, I just selected one from the more recent past. Um, uh, let me call it the hero syndrome. And I selected these two pictures of Mount Rainier to show the, show the upside and the downside of our um, experiences. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of this group and you see some of my partners and our fellows here. And again, thank you for this op uh, opportunity. We also have, and this is a trivia question, the newest country in the world, nation very close to us. If you see the star over there, this is where our hospital is. And this is the new Chaz country, which is uh, uh, right around here. This is a new autonomous country that's formed right here in my very little liberal city. So uh, maybe I can form the first spine center of the new nation of Chaz because it's so close by. That was an attempt at comic relief. These are my con uh, conflicts. Again, in complications, I've published on that, and obviously I think about it and uh, try to prevent them. Uh, there are unavoidable complications, avoidable complications. And again, this, what you're doing is important because review of complication in open, honest, and protected fashion is important for us to learn, to try to improve prevention, and also identify, and this is like TED talk, early recognition and management possible. So this is, again, the context, and I'm stating the obvious here. And right now, I pick up my screen. So I would put this under the hero category, a wannabe hero, and that a wannabe hero is me. This is a 64-year-old patient who came to us in severe pain, and this MRI doesn't do her justice, but she had pretty aggressively become weak. Um, she had a neuric progression that was pretty well documented. Uh, over three-week period, there was no trauma involved. She had an MGOA decline to about nine, uh, she came in a wheelchair. Uh, she had a clear Lermites positive spur wing. She had bladder incontinence. She was in a wheelchair. You get the picture. And she had a dropped head syndrome. It's a tragic story because she's a psychiatry nurse. She's divorced from her physician husband. Uh, she has a significant history of alcohol abuse, and she lives by herself. So the MRI shows a very typical thing. We are inundated in our uh, center with this. Uh, the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. It's a C3 through uh, T1. Uh, uh, diffuse spondylosis, there's no infection there. She has uh, substantial cord signal changes. Um, so that was clear. These are a couple of the studies uh, that we had. And again, uh, this is a diffuse problem. She does smoke a bit, um, not horribly so. Very nice lady in principle, kind of a tragic psychosocial setting. Um, so what to do next? Again, diffuse disease somewhere between C3 and C7 slash T1. Uh, kyphosis, you can see and appreciate that you're somewhat of a coronal deformity. If you ask me for a flexion extension film, I will have to tell you I did not get one. And this is part of the problem now. I did not get a flexion extension film because I was worried about her cord signal changes and her lomites. And in lomites, I usually don't get 
collection extension films. So I can't give you that. But she has, uh, without support, her chin is on her chest and tilted to the side, and it takes some effort to get her into a soft neck collar at least. So I will try to get my next slide going here. And again, the basic question is, I think, I will be presumptuous here, but I think most of us would agree that this is a surgical indication. And the question is, do we do a more focal surgery? Do we do something anterior, posterior, combined? Do we consider a non-fusion procedure in this patient who you yourself and your team have not had any contact with um, uh, ever? She literally rolls into the ER in a wheelchair and uh, here she is a crying mess. And we're obviously gonna admit her. So maybe we can do this as a quick question, uh, anterior, posterior, combined laminoplasty. And I didn't set up a formal poll. Omar, do you wanna do a formal poll or do you wanna just uh, take a lead and uh, give me your thoughts? Yeah, actually it is, it is a difficult case, but actually it is also common at the same time. So you can see that there's kyphosis. She's, uh, she's as I understand it, she's 61. Uh, she has multiple levels. She has a spondy at a uh, level of um, three, four, as I remember, as I can see here. Uh, so actually, if you if you want the perfect uh, decision, it should be anterior and posterior. But actually, there is no perfect answer for for this. Um, some of the surgeon they will go posterior only, which I agree with them. Multiple anterior with maybe two two carpectomy maybe it will it will work also in this case so actually it's, it's depend on the on the surgeon preference some of the surgeons they will do everything anterior and some of them they will do everything posterior so whatever you are uh, uh, feeling comfortable with you can go with it but you have to approach at least anterior i think in my my uh, in, in this thank case. you so maybe in the interest of time, I'll proceed if that's okay. But uh, obviously, if one of you wants to uh, have a comment, uh, feel free. I did just this. I did a front back. Um, call it the hero syndrome, but uh, we, I felt she's healing impaired. She needed lordosis restored. She needed a comprehensive neurologic decompression. She needed the highest chance for fusion. Uh, I did not trust that she would wear a brace. The surgery went very well. We did a, a same day uninstrumented anterior cervical microscopic release and uh, discectomies and a posterior fusion C2 to T2. Caudal, we usually like to stop at T2. We preserve the transition zone ligaments and bone anatomy perfectly. So about six hour surgery, very little blood loss, no uh, intraoperative neuromodulin problems. So far, so good. Uh, Yusri, may I ask you for your criticism maybe? I think it's an excellent job. You, you corrected the kyphosis. You managed to put the cages in the what looked like as a fused level, but I will always say nothing is fused from the front. Uh, you can still go under this space and put your uh, spreader and they can put a cage in. So I, I have no objection what you've done. I think it's an excellent job. Thank you. Summer, any, any prediction as to what's going to go sour? Ted, do you have any comment? Please. No, I mean right right now this looks uh, this looks really good. <laughs> yeah, it won't stay that way. All <laughs> right, let me continue then maybe. Um, so she did wake up with a C5 palsy right side. It was two out of five, so she did twitch. She had a good biceps function, no sensory deficit. There was nothing in her foramen. I was obviously pissed as hell. I'm very careful when I lift off the lamina. We do believe it's a traction injury. One of our fellows, Andrew Jack. Did a very nice, and he won an AO prize for that uh, uh, publication that does lead it more and more towards attraction injury. So when we lift off the lamina, we have to be super careful. I think I was careful, but she had a C5 palsy. So this is what happened. Um, so basically at the three month mark, there was no fall or anything like that. Um, uh, she came, yeah, you can come here, you can say hi. So she came into the ER, again, a crying mess. Now this time she walked in. This is one of our fellows, he saw her, this is Ben Shell. Uh, we still have distancing rules here, so we, uh, I should wear a mask, um, but he's keeping his mask on. So she came into the ER, she had no fall. Uh, I think Ben was on call, actually. Yeah. And you, you tell them, you can take your mask off quickly. This is Dr. Shell, one of our fellows. Um, hey, everybody. So what did you encounter in the ER? Uh, so very distraught patient, uh, you know, prominence right there at the uh, cervicothoracic junction. Uh, no real splaying of the scar, but definitely some erythema and redness, but... Uh, 
clinically very uh, severely kyphosed and she was, uh, you know, like you said, no trauma, no falls, nothing, um, nothing apparent, uh, you know, uh, and even the ER doc said, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Uh, you know, we got a chest x-ray to rule out anything. Um, cause this was kind of in the, right at the start of COVID and, um, you know, they weren't worried. They weren't even going to call us. Um, and then, uh, we, you know, examining her, seeing that she's now myelopathic and getting worse. Uh, then we got those CT scans that you're seeing right there. So she had, except for the C5 positive, thank you, Ben, done really well. Um, and that seemed to be getting better. And uh, then this uh, 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 crapola happens where she just suddenly kyphosis at T2, T3, assume this is T2 at the caudal level. And we can assume that we did a very diligent job keeping the uh, junctional ligaments and soft tissues intact. She had no wound healing problems or anything like that, but now she's kyphotic as hell. And again, can one of you guys help me? What did I do wrong? What, what's what's uh, wrong? First, uh, there's a nice question thing. actually from the attendees, the, from Dr. Firas. Did you have a, like a full spine x-rays? Ah, I did not get flexion extension films. I did not get full films. That's, that's, that's one of the issues as well. I was a and hero. I wanted to be a hero. <laughs> I didn't do my due diligence. So you're getting to the bingo point here. And uh, uh, is she like the trustful patient, like a psychiatric patient, actually? That's she, she was a psychiatric nurse, a mental health worker. And again, she was divorced for like three years. Her husband was an ER doctor, I believe. So there was a mess of life. She'd been apparently a longstanding alcoholic. And so that's, I think, the cause of the unfortunate divorce. And she's living by herself. And I guess she, she had kind of just been a little bit neglectful there at home. She did not have a stable setting with friends and family. So, so now here we have this setting. Uh, you want some longer films. So um, we have at least a long CT reconstruction. At this point in time, I did not get a scoliosis standing film, but not only did I not get flexion extension films, I did not get full length standing films. Um, and uh, this is where we are now. So, um, who of you wants to answer how, how to revise this now and how low to go? Uh, Shadi, can, can you give us your opinion? Sure. Uh, first is a great case, uh, Dr. Chapman. This is uh, exactly what I would have done to start with. Um, I don't think that there was anything that I would have done differently from what you, uh, you did to this patient. Um, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, so she developed a, a distal junctional failure. Um, could be some uh, soft tissue uh, weakening at the time of the surgery, or, uh, or could be just her bone quality, considering that she's alcoholic. Um, she may not have the best bone meta metabolism. So that could have not also, um, could have played into the development of the fracture. In terms of revising it, so uh, you're going to have to uh, uh, connect to the thoracic spine. The question is where to stop at the thoracic spine level. And considering that she has failed at T2, I would not want to stop at the apex. So I'm going to just span the apex when I choose a neutral vertebra. So probably around T, T10, T11, or T9, depending on uh, how it looks or what's, what's the size of the pedicle. And at that point, I'm going to start thinking about am i gonna cement my screws um, or the fixation is going to be um, sufficient as it is but i will certainly span it down to t9 t10 uh, area past the past the uh, mid thoracic kyphosis good well thank you for your uh, discussion and um, that's kind of what we did uh, now one thing i want to point out and do you see my cursor right now? She has some lumbar deformity down here. Uh, she does not have a bad stenosis, so we now have MRIs and all that, but she has this kind of asymmetric collapse of L45, L5S1, so. It seems like she has some rotatory uh, component to it. Yes, for sure. She kind of is right. just twisted uh, out of line. So we Something did not, yeah. So you go ahead, you go ahead. No, I mean, with that, with that in mind, I would either try to stay stay away from it as much as possible or um if i cannot stop uh farther from it i'm gonna have to include it unfortunately and then then next section would be 
how low you're going to go, S1 pelvis or not. But hopefully, based on the MRI, you can stop at T9, T10. So this is a very valuable discussion. So we use routinely the Hounsfield units um, on the axial and sagittal reformats to kind of screen patients who we do urgently. And again, in her case, her Hounsfield units were documented to be around 100, 110 or so. So they weren't a red flag. Uh, I was really surprised. And if you look at the failure mode, it was actually ligamentous. So we did an intradisc osteotomy and she did very well. We got a perfect correction of this. And at the bottom, we did an LIV uh, at L1, an LIV minus one uh, methylmethacolate fixation. I don't have a clinical picture, it's hard to see, but we did a shaft rebanding around the L2 spinous process. And we tracked that with a, um, a, a connector to kind of reinforce that. So this is a rebalancing film now. And again, she had a very nice posture. And um, this is an early post-operative film, so this time I did not let her go out of the hospital before we had a nice image. And um, so this looked pretty good. So LIV uh, and LIV minus one PMA, but I did feel better uh, about stopping at L1, which as we continue, um, so distal banding down here, so far so good. But now what you're starting to see is that this collapse at the bottom, which seemed to be pretty asymptomatic, it's clearly worsening. So this is a recent film, so she's now six months out. She's very grateful. She actually neurologically did amazingly well. We got her off the booze. We uh, augmented her nutrition dramatically. And so she's done quite well, but uh, I think the writing is on the wall. Um, this is just a matter of time until we will visit the pelvis on her and straighten her out. So um, would this have happened? Um, I don't know who you wanna ask Omar. Uh, had we stopped at T11 and uh, followed the advice of our colleague to, to preserve the thoracal lumbar junction? Uh, did I put more stress at the L4 to S1 junction or not? Ted, can you give us your opinion about that? Well, I, I, uh, one of the things that you mentioned, Jens, in the original um, presentation was that she had uh, some element of dropped head syndrome. And um, and that's something that, that is a, a red flag for me because I, um, I often feel like I don't fully understand dropped head syndrome. And, um, and, and when they represent uh, primary myopathies uh, versus uh, some other uh, uh, neurologic disorder. Um, and so, uh, so I'm very cautious around patients that have uh, dropped head syndrome. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing that I would say is, is that you, your initial surgery went down to uh, what, T3? T2. T2. Um, and um, and, and I'm, I'm guessing that you, like the rest of us, are doing that now because you had a number that you stopped at C7 that, that had distal junctional failure. Yep. Um, but I think what we're all finding is that, um, is that uh, stopping at T2 or T3 is not is no guarantee against distal junctional failure in these patients, which again points out the fact to me that we don't fully understand it. Um, so uh, I would have uh, done something very similar to this. I, I probably would have been um, uh, leaned towards stopping in the lower thoracic spine, but that to me, that, that in no way does that mean that stopping at L1 uh, is, is somehow the proximate cause of her, um, of her degenerative instability now at, at uh, 3, 4. So, um, so I, 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 I struggle with these cases as well. Um, I think that we as uh, spine surgeons uh, are, are only painfully learning to, to give um, uh, respect to patients who have neuromuscular disorders. And, and that no matter how good our initial post-op films look, um, uh, these patients are very precarious. Really insightful comments. Thank you, Ted. So uh, alcoholic myopathy is actually a well-known thing. We had actually scanned her head after the surgery. She did not have anything beyond a cerebellar kind of uh, atrophy, uh, but there are certain nutritional and neuronal pathway disruptions in these patients that are profound. And especially as we create a long lever arm, it becomes more and more um, of a, a race of time to try to rebalance what has been substantially lost over probably well over a decade, if not two, mm -hmm. of um, uh, self inebriation and uh, self-destruction. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
we will overshort along. We're trying to obviously buy time, try to build her up a little bit more. Right now, she's still good. She's uh, in a uh, lumbar corset right now. We're doing PT. Our pools, can you answer this? Our pools are still closed uh, due to COVID. Um, and so we're kind of limited in our rehab uh, access right now. Um, so uh, learning points for me, again, myelopathy, I think is a pretty clear surgical uh, indication. Um, we do have to have a comprehensive assessment of these patients. And again, I told you a couple of things that I now probably want to do. I, uh, and I certainly have, yet again, a whole new respect for the complexities of patients. And rather than sending her home after surgery, which we're very much pushed to do, especially with our COVID problem, we could not send the patient into any, uh, any rehab unit. Uh, I would have preferred having her in a, a somewhat guarded facility rather than sending her home. Um, obviously, detoxing patients beforehand, prehabbing patients, looking at psychosocial elements, detoxing them profoundly, bone densities before we do a heroic surgery is always a humbling learning point for me. And that's something where I think I failed this patient. I'm happy to take your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jens, for your sharing your case. It is a very nice case, but I'm sure it's unfortunate for the patient. Um, actually, because of the time limit, we'll proceed with the fourth presentation. Shadi, can you share your screen? And then we'll try to accommodate as much as question as we can. Can you see? Yes, we can see the screen. All right. Um, seems like uh, in this presentation, we're sharing a common theme, which is um, trying to be a hero when it's probably unnecessary. So um, I would like to uh, uh, thank the uh, committee for uh, uh, inviting me to give this lecture. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues who are presenting and uh, for the opportunity to learn from all of you. These are my disclosures. So I'd like to start uh, my presentation with this quote from Winston Churchill, and it states, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. So I hope no one loses enthusiasm as we go through these cases. So my patient is a 60-year-old female who presented with a thoracic uh, gibbous deformity. Uh, she also had a history of lumbar pain with sciatica that was treated on and off over the years with physical therapy epidural injections. Uh, when she presented to the clinic, she had difficulty with ambulation. She had an unsteady gait. Um, and she does have a history of diabetes with peripheral neuropathy as well. On the physical exam, she was noted to have a stiff scissoring gait. The motor strength was some weakness in the lower extremity, mainly in the foot dorsiflexion uh, uh, flexion and the EHL, uh, as well as spasticity felt on the examination and some hyperreflexia. So the, these are our standing uh, full length films, the AP and the lateral views. It seems like uh, this patient is uh, um, related to a uh, U3's patient. Um, except she's an adult patient. So we got an MRI of her thoracic spine. As you can see here, the uh, sharp, stiff deformity, uh, likely congenital kyphosis. She'd never had any history of infection or major trauma as a kid. So uh, we're likely dealing with a congenital anomaly of the thoracic vertebrae with the congenital kyphosis. Uh, more importantly, here we see the uh, thoracic uh, cord being draped over with the compressive uh, thoracic myelopathy. On top of that, on the right side, uh, we see the lumbar uh, MRI, which shows a disc disease uh, and some level of stenosis at L4-5 and L5-S1. Now, if we go back and show the x-ray, she did have element of segmental instability at L4-5 and L5-S1. 
In order to better understand the bony architecture of the deformity, we got a CAT scan and it shows the, um, the ankyloses uh, and the wedge deformity. Um, uh, I wouldn't say deformity, but that's just anomaly because it's congenital uh, between T5 and T7. So at this point, um, she has been living with this condition for uh, an extended period of time. Her symptoms started when she was uh, in her mid-30s. So she's been dealing with this for 30 years almost, and she's showing some deterioration due to her thoracic myelopathy. On top of that, there's a, another element of pathology, which is the lumbar spine at L4-5 and L5-S1. Uh, with the genitive spondylolisthesis associated with low back pain and sciatica. So in terms of surgical planning, one would think about these options come to mind. Um, should we do um, thoracic spine only? Uh, and when we talk about thoracic only uh, approach or, or techniques, are we talking about anterior, posterior, posterior only osteotomies uh, with uh, vertebral column resection? I believe we, we went through the, that mental exercise in Eustri's case. The other alternative would be here to consider the lumbar spine as well, uh, whether we should include it uh, with the construct. And once we start talking about the thoracic and lumbar spine procedure, where to stop. Um, Samah or Omar, do you, can you please uh, address one to one of the uh, panel? See what, what choice would they do? Can you, can you please give us your opinion? Dr. Ahmed? Uh, I think this is a challenging case. Um, I, um, I, I know that uh, Dr. Chapman had uh, previously mentioned maybe putting somebody in traction. I still think there's a role for that, even in adults, even though you're not going to fix the angular deformity here. Uh, but you could see how much her cord would tolerate in terms of stretch. So I may consider that, although I think you're going to get a very small uh, bang for your buck there. Um, but I think for me, it would be a posterior only approach. It would be a VCR. Um, I would, you know, study the anatomy very carefully on my 3D model and CT scans and try to figure out how much bone I actually need to resect because you don't not need to always resect the entire deformity. But it looks like in her, you probably would end up taking out three vertebra. And um, I would try to shorten her, but not, uh, not enough where you start uh, overly kinking the dura. Um, so I think for me, this would be a staged posterior approach. I'd probably put all my implants in, actually release her ribs, uh, do the exposure portion of the VCR, but not complete the VCR. i probably then on a second day finish the VCR with the thought being, uh, just again, just taking a little bit longer in terms of time for the correction here. So, um, but that's just uh, a thought. And then how far down you go, you're probably going to go somewhere in the lumbar spine. And if you get close enough to L4, you may end up having to go down to L5 or the pelvis. Um, so I, I think this is a challenging one, but I think you, you just kind of, you keep on following, uh, following that path. You probably end up down to her pelvis because of, uh, or four or five spondy. So either you are able to stop in a neutral vertebra L2 or so, a couple of vertebra away from L4 or 5, or you end up including the four or five into the fusion. So, yes, thank you, Ahmed. These are exactly we went through this mental exercise with her multiple times. Um, we didn't really book her right away for surgery. We had to discuss these options and give her some time to think about it. And that was the plan basically to, uh, she said, I want to stop, uh, I want one stop shop with surgery, I want to have it done all at the same time because the, the low back pain at times is severe as equally as bad as her thoracic pain. So the, the game plan for us were to, uh, was to do the T2 to pelvis, um, including the, um, uh, the kyphosis correction, um, uh, generous decompression, try the osteotomies. We're trying to, to uh, perform the Y osteotomy instead of doing a VCR. Uh, the precautions that came to mind um, when dealing with this kind of procedure, and those were echoed uh, by my colleagues earlier, you want to keep the maps uh, high, you want to keep the patient warm, you're going to uh, uh, closely follow the neuromonitoring, you're going to have a low threshold for transfusional cell saver, and um, um, even consider having two surgeons, two hands uh, that are technically skilled, can make these cases um, 
easier, uh, faster for the patient and uh, less draining for the surgeon. So uh, on the OR day, uh, we planned T2 to sacrum and pelvis. Uh, the neuromonitoring was diminished in the lower extremity due to her peripheral neuropathy, but was somehow detectable. Uh, during, we performed the exposure from T2 to pelvis. We instrumented uh, all vertebrae uh, between T2 to pelvis. Uh, we tried to keep the MAP goals uh, between the 85 and 90, at least during the exposure and before start doing the bony work. Uh, however, we, uh, she was um, challenging to the anesthesiologist due to some labile blood pressure. She would spike up and then she would crash down uh, without uh, any rhyme or reason. So the time when we were doing the laminectomy, uh, we would start finish, we just finished the T4 to 8 laminectomy without doing any um, uh, osteotomy work yet. We had uh, an acute loss of sensory motor and bilateral lower extremities. So at that point, um, we start thinking, what did we do wrong? We haven't done any correction yet. Um, we haven't done any bony osteotomy yet. Uh, it was just the laminectomy, and it, she could have had maybe a rotation of her cord to start with her to start with her thoracic cord was um, um, under a lot of tension anteriorly, and that uh, an irritation could have been made during the laminectomy, or could be due to her labile um, uh, blood pressure and not controlling her maps above eighty five at all time or above ninety. Uh, could have uh, resulted into a hyperperfusion or even uh, an ischemic or infarction of the cord. So at that point, uh, these questions came to mind. Should we abort surgery? Uh, uh, should we start waking her up and try to do the wake-up test? Um, and or should we uh, proceed with deformity correction? Uh, Any one of the panel would like to answer maybe uh, quickly in the interest of time? I would have uh, closed quickly, turned her over, and um, and woken her up and, and aborted for the day, wait and see if you get motors back. Thank you very much. This is what I did not do. So that was mistake number one, probably, uh, instead. Uh, so I did the wait, tried to do wake-up test. She's Spanish-speaking. We have a hard time, although the nurse anesthetist was Spanish-speaking, we weren't able to communicate properly with the patient. Since uh, we did a, uh, a two-surgeon approach, uh, so uh, or two-surgeon surgery, so uh, I kept my uh, my assistant surgeon in the OR while optimizing keeping the map the maps above 95, warming up the patient, transfusing her, um, and uh, close checking on any neuromonitoring improvement. Uh, I went outside and actually had a family meeting. So I went and discussed with her family the findings. Um, uh, that we were dealing with as we were trying to optimize her optimize her hemodynamics because otherwise I wouldn't have done anything different if I want to close her up. Um, so um, we decided to talk to the family uh, and talk, give them the option of closing her up, wait and see, or uh, do the deformity correction, thinking that um, the uh, continuous tethering of the spinal cord across the uh, the deformity may be a, a factor playing at play here. Uh, so the thought it was if we were able to decompress the spinal cord and, and even obtain some degree of correction, uh, we would recoil the spinal cord, we shorten the spinal cord, it would be at, at less risk of uh, continuous stretching. So we, we proceeded based on the family wishes to um, continue with the surgery. We, we finished the osteotomies. Uh, with uh, almost 700 blood loss uh, between T5 and T7, uh, we continue to see no neuromonitoring improvement. So the first complication here was the a new neurologic deficit. So after surgery, we obtained MRIs uh, as well as a CT scan. Now the MRI is, is very limited due to the uh, metal artifact, but we couldn't see anything convincing on the MRI and the CT scan uh, also, we scanned her entire spine, and, uh, and there was no misplaced hardware, there's no malalignment at the osteotomy site, um, there's no bony fragment in the canal that were visible. And this is basically the, the, the correction that we obtained uh, at the uh, osteotomy site. 
So at that point, since we finished the, the procedure and the deformity correction, uh, we kept, she was kept intubated due to the length of the procedure and the resuscitation. Uh, we uh, sent her to the ICU uh, and we tried to wean the sedation to get a uh, proper neurologic examination. And it's unchanged, She's, she was not moving her lower extremity. Uh, we had uh, family meetings almost on a daily basis um, for the first week. Um, and things were stable, no improvement, uh, but no deterioration. Up until post-op day seven, when she starts spiking fever and having more oxygen demands uh, on the ventilator. So now we get chest x-ray uh, and they see some opacity in the lungs and uh, some uh, suspicion of hemonemothorax. So we get the CT scan and she indeed has a, a, a uh, hemonemothorax as well as a lung consolidation that deemed to be an aspiration pneumonia. So she, she was treated with a chest tube placement and IV antibiotic for a pneumonia. Those are the, the subsequent complications. We continue having family meetings um, every other day uh, until post-op day 20, uh, when she was good enough to be uh, uh, switched from um, an ET tube to tracheostomy. And almost three weeks after surgery, she cleared her pneumonia and she was discharged to rehab. Until we saw her again in the clinic approximately six weeks after surgery. Um, the incision was healing well. Um, the, the exam showed some sensory improvement in lower extremities and some return of some toe uh, flickering in the lower extremity with minimal motion across the, the feet. We got the x-ray uh, in the post-op. And we see the uh, proximal um, hardware disconnection at the level of T2. At that point, we sent her to get a CT scan and the CT scan showed this. Dr. Yusri, what, what you will do for this case? Uh, this, uh, this will be the fourth complication, uh, junction kyphosis, and uh, we have to treat that. So I would extend the fusion to C2. Thank you, Yusri. So uh, um, we got an MRI as well, and the MRI showed that there is indeed a mechanical compression on the thoracic cord at that level. And uh, we went through that again. I mean, it's as you can imagine, this conversation uh, with the family, it's, uh, it's, it's humbling every time uh, you see them and, and there's another problem you have to tackle. So at this point, uh, we wanna make sure that it's just a mechanical failure, it's not an infectious. So the White County SR and CRP were drawn and they were within normal limits. Uh, so we felt that this is purely mechanical failure. Uh, there's no uh, uh, suspicion for infection. So we decided, as you said, is just to, to decompress the cord and extend the fusion to the cervical spine, at least to a neutral level. So we ended up uh, going up uh, extending the fusion to the uh, C uh, to the C4 uh, and placement of pedicle screws actually in C6 and C7 uh, across the junction and doing cervical laminectomy. And these are her post-op X-rays. Her second hospitalization for the extension of fusion was relatively uncomplicated. Um, she continued to have bowel bladder incontinence. She uh, continued to exhibit improvement in her sensation lower extremities. Uh, she, despite the persistent weakness in lower extremities, she continued to have some motion across the, uh, the foot and ankle and toes. Um, she was deceased back to rehab and was seen uh, on further post-op visits uh, with hardware seems to be stable and neuro neurology with slight, more imp slight improvement but not functional movement yet in the lower extremities. So in summaries, these cases are challenging, uh, in this case specifically because there's pre-existing cord compromised thoracic myelopathy due to underlying severe congenital kyphosis, uh, more than 100 degree. Um, although precautions were taken for hemodynamic optimization, uh, one should be more cautious and make sure that uh, to keep a continuous communication with anesthesia to make sure even though with mobile with labile blood pressure to keep a better control of it. 
Um, surgical decision making is a big controversy here of where to stop. Should you include lumbar spine? Uh, should you stop when you when you first encounter the uh, uh, the SSCPs or, or uh, uh, the neuromonitoring changes? Um, I see it's very important to set expectation, reasonable expectations uh, uh, with these patients because yes, in the best hands you may still have complications, and those complications. Um, are real and they're uh, um, they're bad and they have bad consequences. Um, and when complication happen, uh, you should you should keep a very close dialogue and communication with the patient and their family. You should not ignore them. Um, and I think that's the that's the best thing to do. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you, Shadi, for your sharing your case. And uh, we go with the last but not the least, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, Shadi, can you stop sharing your screen? And uh, Dr. Ahmed, can you start sharing your screen? Actually, it is great uh, cases, and we are lo all learning from these cases. It's difficult decision, difficult cases. And uh, an excellent correction, Shadi, by the way. Um, it's pretty unfortunate, but it's a really excellent correction. Thank you, thank you. Uh, one of my mentors used to used to say, "We don't treat X-rays; uh, we treat uh, patients." And uh, yes, at the end, the X-ray or the CT scan may look perfect, but the outcome may may not be the same. Yeah, it's a it's a very humbling um, webinar because we're seeing that all of these uh, great surgeons uh, have complications, and so uh, not to be. Uh, outshined by complications. I'm here to show you mine. Uh, so this happened to me in my second year of practice, and um, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures for this. I do want to acknowledge all the clinicians that helped me, all the surgeons that helped me in this, uh, in this case, uh, because again, it's a team approach. Uh, I I'm I'm learned to be fairly humble when it comes to these complications. I try to recruit as many people as possible to share in my pain. Um, but this is a very nice 76 year old male that came to me with essentially worsening thoracic myelopathy. Uh, so he had uh, lower extremity weakness, gait dysfunction, he had bowel and bladder dysfunction, wouldn't, couldn't hold on to his urine. He had a history of two prior thoracic discectomy uh, fusions, uh, sorry, uh, surgeries um, done uh, elsewhere at a different institution. They were both done by a very good surgeon. Uh, the first one was done almost 10 years prior to seeing me uh, and was a non-instrumented thoracic discectomy. The second one was a revision uh, in which they performed a fusion, but during that second surgery, they actually had to abort the operation because they lost motor evoke potentials. They had a dural tear during that operation and the patient woke up with bilateral lower extremity paraplegia. Um, he recovered from that paraplegia, but then had worsening thoracic myelopathy and he was never uh, fully decompressed during that operation. So they essentially abandoned that surgery. So uh, I think being a little bit overly uh, ambitious, I thought, well, I'm in my second year of practice. I've done a few of these. I can take care of this. So uh, not, uh, not heeding uh, a lot of the warning signs that I can now see. So uh, he shows up to me and this was his exam. So he had kind of diffuse four out of five weakness in bilateral lower extremities particularly in his proximal muscles and his iliopsoas. He had a wide base spastic gait. He had upgoing toes on uh, Babinski bilaterally. And this is the imaging study. So this is T67. Uh, and he's had now fusion at this level. And despite that, he has worsening myelopathy. So this is about four years out from his second operation. Um, and you can see this large, uh, what looks to be a calcified disc that's uh, deforming the cord. You can see the cord almost wrapped around the disc at this level. And this is the CT scan at the level of maximal uh, compression. And you can see this kind of um, calcified disc here. And whenever, whenever you see this, I think it should be a warning sign to all of us that this is likely going to be very tightly adherent to the dura if there's going to be dura at all. Uh, and certainly they tried to get this through a posterior lateral approach. You can see the pedicle has been resected here. Uh, but despite that, they got into the dura, they abandoned because they lost motors from a posterior approach. So. Thinking about that, I said, well, we need to come anteriorly. We need to be able to take this out without putting any pressure on the thoracic cord. Uh, and so I did this through a thoracotomy. And so the fifth rib uh, was resected for bone graft uh, as part of the thoracotomy. Sixth rib was divided. 
and we perform partial corpectomies of T6 and T7. We remove the entire calcified disc, and sure enough, there was no ventral dura at all. Uh, we used the autogenous rib to perform an anterior fusion at that level. Uh, primary dura repair, we just couldn't find an edge of dura. No matter how far lateral we would go, it would just be more uh, lack of dura that we would find. So we stopped, did not try to get a dura repair directly. We used a duragen patch, which is essentially just a type 1 collagen patch, and augmented that with dura seal. And uh, we used intraoperative ultrasound to help us confirm the adequacy of the decompression. We could see blood flow through the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. The cord looked good and pulsatile. And uh, essentially, we placed a subarachnoid drain in the lumbar spine and drained him at about 10 cc's of uh, CSF uh, per hour to try to divert away from the um, uh, thoracic uh, dural tear. And uh, chest tube was placed to gravity, and we just watched that carefully uh, until it was ready to come out. So eventually patient was discharged home uh, with a, uh, a slightly improved neurologic exam two weeks after surgery. So this is uh, his uh, localization film. You can see uh, the previous fusion, they have unilateral instrumentation. This is the immediate post-op x-ray and you can clearly see the lung is taking a little bit of a hit here. Uh, but by two weeks, we essentially see a relatively clear lung field. There's a little bit of a pleural fusion slash CSF accumulation at the bottom of the lung field. So um, no, of note, the first complication that occurred was during this first hospitalization. So this guy essentially was um, in the hospital for two weeks. On post-operative day 12, he awoke with zero out of five anterior tibialis function on one side. No weakness, uh, sorry, no pain, just weakness. So we did order an MRI thoracic and lumbar spine. Uh, and eventually we ruled out any compressive causes for this, but the guy slept so hard on that one side that he actually had a perineal neuropathy. It slowly recovered, but essentially a very, very dense uh, weakness of his uh, anterior tib uh, that slowly came back. But because of that, we had an opportunity to image him, and this was the first opportunity to see the pseudomeningocele starting to form. Uh, and so this is the level of the decompression. You can see the little rib anteriorly, and you can see the pseudomeningocele that is formed uh, around the cord here. The lumbar spine was imaged too just because of the foot drop, just to make sure we didn't let, have a foraminal stenosis issue or some other reason for him to have. Um, so he lives seven hours away from our hospital. And at about one month after the surgery, I'm out of town and one of my partners says, your patient called, he's dyspneic, uh, he's having trouble breathing, he has a positional headache, he's describing foul breath. Uh, so he returns to see us, and sure enough, the pseudomeningocele is now a lot more symptomatic. Uh, and at that time, he was offered surgery, but he was so terrified of the operation because the first one was so big that he decided to leave against medical advice. So he was admitted, but this was the admission x-ray one month after surgery, and you can really clearly see the lung is now starting to get obliterated. This is the MRI coronal. You can see very, very little of the lung field left. This is all CSF accumulating in his chest. Um, at three and a half months after surgery, he personally calls me and he says, I, I, I can't live this way. I have a positional headache, so I can't stand and I can't walk. But if I lay down, I actually cough up fluid that tastes metallic uh, in my mouth. And I'm not sure how many of you have eaten organ meats, but brain, kidney, you know, they all have a slightly metallic taste. And so when I heard that, I said, boy, this is CSF. He's coughing up CSF. Um, and sure enough, uh, shortly thereafter, he started losing his sight and his hearing. Uh, and essentially, this poor guy couldn't lay flat, couldn't stand up. Essentially, he, he felt like he was dying. And, and sure enough, he was uh, because of this problem. So when he became blind and couldn't hear anymore, he showed up. And this was his CT head. And this shows uh, subdural hygromas, which is essentially fluid collection around the brain from the brain being pulled down. If you look at his ventricles, they're essentially empty. So these ventricles are showing CSF hypotension. And you can see how the brain is sagging down. It almost looks like he has a Chiari malformation, but he doesn't. But it's just from lack of uh, spinal fluid. And we re-imaged him, and sure enough, he has a very large dural pleural fistula connecting to his lung. And if you look very carefully, that's actually the cord herniating through the ventral dural defect. So he has a spinal cord herniation as well.
So we planned another operation, and this was obviously with some degree of consultation with a whole bunch of different people, our plastic surgeons, our thoracic surgeons. Uh, and what we decided to do was an omental flap harvested from his belly, and then we can tunnel that through his diaphragm into the area of the chest, and then use that to separate the chest from the spinal uh, cavity. So essentially, what we're trying to do is create a way of uh, diverting the CSF so that it doesn't want to go into the chest, but wants to stay uh, around the spine so that we can get a stable pseudomeningocele instead of a communicating pseudomeningocele. Uh, so we put him back into the right lateral decubitus position. We reused the old thoracotomy incision um, after we had harvested the omental flap. So we had harvested the omental flap first, tucked it under the diaphragm so that it was very close to the left side diaphragm, uh, then repositioned him, reapproached the thoracotomy. Uh, we opened the diaphragm as close to the um, spine as we could so that we would not have to travel too far across the uh, diaphragm with the uh, om omentum and kink the blood supply. And then we uh, tunneled that and then used multiple um, suture anchors to tack down the omentum across the chest. We did uh, at this point because that negative pressure had been pulling on the cord and the dura for so long, we actually now had a edge that we could sew to. So we sewed in a bovine pericardial patch uh, and then augmented that with Duragen, Duraseal, um, and then this uh, omental flap was tacked down. Uh, the lung was then decorticated in order to try to decrease the dead space. And once again, we placed another subarachnoid drain, five days of bed rest uh, with the patient. So this is the omental flap being harvested from the belly. And you can see how we've tunneled it through the diaphragm into the chest. So again, here's the omental flap. You can see it's quite a versatile flap. And so this is something that I think we should keep in the back pocket here, but you can actually get quite a good, good amount of vascularized tissue. And you can see it's the stalk here and how long that omental flap is. So we've tucked that underneath the diaphragm. We've made a di diaphragmatic incision in the bottom right-hand corner. You can see how now this is the thoracotomy incision and that's the omentum being pulled through the diaphragm. Um, and you can see now how having, having inset that omentum here. So you can see this is the diaphragm. This is the spine back here. This is the rib. And you can see how the omentum has been tacked in. You can see the suture anchors here uh, uh, tacking it down to both the chest wall and the ribs. So this is the immediate post-op chest x-ray. And uh, at two weeks, you can see the lungs starting to inflate again. Uh, CSF is incredibly toxic. Uh, it's, it's very caustic. So if you've ever gone into a pseudomeningocele, you'll see this just shiny white layer of, of tissue everywhere because CSF just doesn't let anything heal. And so it makes the lung you know, very smooth. So that's why we decorticated the lung. And so again, this is almost two weeks uh, after the surgery. You can see the omental flap here. And you can see now the stable pseudomeningocele that's no longer communicating with the chest. You can actually see the pericardial patch that we've sewn in, the little bovine pericardial patch. Still see the little rib that we've placed for, for fusion anteriorly. Um, and this is two weeks post-op, his head CT, you can see much smaller hygromas. The head is starting to expand. You can see the ventricles now have CSF in them. Uh, so we're, you know, the, uh, the kind of uh, low pressure situation is starting to resolve. So in final follow-up, I mean, I watched this guy for four years after surgery and he's never been happy with me, but he's happy that I stuck through it with him. And I think that's a recurring theme that we've heard from all of the surgeons is stay in close communication with your patients. Um, you can do really, really horrible things to people, but they are forgiving if they know that you're trying your absolute best, that you're being humble, that you're really not letting any stone go unturned in trying to help them. So he still has a wide based unsteady spastic gait. Uh, he's recovered to four out of five anterior tib. Uh, strength and the rest of his muscles are actually five out of five. So overall, there's some neurologic improvement, uh, but he now has neuropathic pain in his legs, which was not present before surgery. And so this is our four-year final follow-up x-ray. You can see the thoracic cord is sick at that level. It's not a normal thoracic cord, uh, but we do still have a stable pseudomeningocele. You can see how much atrophy the omental flap has had over five, over four years, but it's still there providing a barrier between it and the chest um, and so it functioned well to save this guy uh, from a horrible outcome. Uh, but uh, again, I think this is my lack of wisdom uh, uh, early on in my career. I hope I don't make this mistake again, but I expect that I probably will make similar, if not worse, mistakes. So, um, and we ended up publishing this 
if you guys ever want to read the actual case report, but I've essentially summarized it. So, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmad Nasri. You keep blowing me away with your cases. Every single case you present needs a separate webinar. Um, always very challenging, always very different. Uh, such an excellent case. Uh, let me ask Ken Chapman here, uh, would you have done anything different uh, with their case? Again, there's another common theme outside of uh, being in the company of outstanding surgical colleagues, and that is the theme of thankless cases. Uh, so <clears throat> again, uh, mid-thoracic calcific disc herniations are a damn if you do, damn if you don't do it uh, scenario. Uh, there is no real um, golden opportunity. I not too long ago had a macro disc and we did everything absolutely beautifully. She's weaker now, but she's actually coming back. But I mean, we'd fortunately prepped her on several visits, so there was no, not a big surprise, but it's still so frustrating because you've, with finest touch and all the preparations we've talked about, and it's still it's just like, damn. Now my question to Ahmed, and this is again, I know you, you're such a brilliant mind and surgeon, uh, the, the phenomenon of a, a ventricular pleural shunt is obviously widely feared, and I know of severe cases that died from this, so kudos to you to have saved the patient and stuck with the patient. This was a close call for sure. Do you think that our posterolateral lateral decompression techniques, even if there is a dural deficiency, have less of this catastrophic and so complicated risk? I think it's a very good question. I, I do almost all of these now posterior laterally, even the really hard ones. And I just take more and more bone and I am willing to deal with a CSF leak from a posterior approach if it's not communicating with the chest. Uh, but I have had to resect the dura circumferentially because I just can't get a disc out. Because like you said, if these have the massive disc herniations, I actually have a video of a lady where I had to resect the dura 360 degrees and I took fascia lata to reconstruct after a very massive uh, calcified disc, but I did it through a bilateral costal transrosectomy. I didn't know that at this point. I was only in my second year of practice. I didn't really know that that was possible. And this person had had two costal transrosectomies already. Um, and so the rib head was already gone, the pedicle was already gone. And I kept on thinking to myself, how am I gonna find the right plane to be able to get back in there without going right through the cord uh, or right through the chest and, and having that same issue? So. I think now I may have attempted this posterior laterally. Um, honestly, I think this guy still would have had a horrible complication because I mean, the person that did this case before me is a, is a, is a very well-regarded neurosurgeon and he abandoned the case because he couldn't finish it. Um, so I, I think this was a challenging one. The good thing is the, the, the transthoracic approach, it's much less likely that you're gonna get a neurologic issue, right? So. Uh, we were able to pull everything directly away from the cord without ever pushing into the cord. Um, I think with the costal transrosectomy, you can sometimes get disoriented, but I think as long as you're always pushing forward into a cavity that you've created, I think it's a little safer, and that's what I tend to do now. Ted, any thoughts regarding that case? Uh, not much uh, that beyond what's already been said. Um, I, I think... Um, the best you can do is prep the patient for the extremely high risk they're about to uh, uh, be put under. And, and, and I've had a few patients who were sent to me uh, for, uh, for similar calcified thoracic ventral discs um, who after I finished counseling them said, you know what, maybe I'll live with what I have. Dr. Yosri, any thoughts? Uh, in medical school, we were taught that the omentum is the policeman of the body or the abdomen. And uh, I once used it to cover the spine with, where infection was there for like a year. And I think this is an ingenious way of uh, pulling the omentum up to the thorax. So uh, I wouldn't consider it as a, as a worst case. It's, it's a good case, I think. I think that goes with uh, the comment of our friend Nay uh, from Saudi. You can never go wrong with an omentum flap. Yes, it's definitely a safety net in uh, such difficult uh, situations. Uh, Shady, any comments? No, I'm. Um, I admire the case and the, the work that uh, Ahmed did. That's excellent work, and I could have not done anything better or different uh, than what he did. Um, 
thoracic discs are always complicated. Um, and as uh, Dr. Chapman said, is damn if you do them, if you don't do them. And uh, that is true. Um, I think the outcome that Ahmad got is probably better than I would have thought it would happen in my hand. Great. Well, I think uh, with uh, Dr. Nas's uh, presentation, we, we got to the end of uh, our webinar. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all our speakers today, the panel, uh, Dr. Yusri, Ted Shoma, Jens Chapman, Jadita Nouri, and Ahmad Nasr. Thank you very much. It takes uh, a lot of effort and it takes uh, uh, being an excellent surgeon, a very humble excellent surgeon to present such challenging cases and complications. Thank you very much for being with us today and taking the time out, out of your busy schedule to present those cases to learn from. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, all our, uh, to thank my co-moderator, Omar, thank you for uh, being with us today. Thank you. As, as usual. Uh, all the attendees, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for taking the time. We hope you enjoyed our webinar. And uh, before we go, we're just reminding, we're just reminding you our next webinar, which is gonna be on July 10th uh, on Friday. It's gonna be the first uh, webinar between AOSpine and AOTrauma. We'll be talking about something different, which is think bigger, bigger, what worked before won't work further, won't work now. We'll be talking about evidence-based medicine in the future after the COVID era. And for that, we have Mohit Bandari, who's an excellent researcher and an excellent speaker and the founder of evidence-based medicine. He will be talking to us about that. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you all. God bless you all. And uh, stay safe and hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.